Radio, where I have one of my most favorite shows, none other than Christian Networking Entrepreneurs with Pastor Teresa McCurry. Take it away, Pastor T. Thank you so much, Apostle James, and thank you guys for tuning in to CNE, Christian Networking Entrepreneurs, the show where emerging entrepreneurs, small business owners, and community leaders come for business and personal development. So welcome to the show today, October 1st, 2020. And today we have a phenomenal guest. His name is Jeff Caliguire. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you, Teresa. Super T, Pastor T, it is just so good to be with you. And uh, I, I just feel like we get to hang out together and invite some friends to hang out with us. So I am so excited about this show. Thanks for inviting me. I am so excited to have you here. So you guys don't know, I met Jeff way back in like 2014, 15. He was my coach for about a year or so, really helped me with some things in my life and helped me get direction with things going on. So Jeff, tell the viewing audience a little bit about yourself. We call this part ETR, earn the right. So I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you can earn the right to give us the information that you're gonna give us today. Wow. Well, I don't know if I, I'll, I won't say I earned the right. I'll look at it as grace. <laughs> okay. But it is, it is good to be here. I, I am a, a guy born in New Jersey, born outside of New York city, youngest of three kids who now gets to live in Colorado. <clears throat> I live right outside of Boulder, looking out my window. I can see mountains and chickens. Uh, <laughs> so th that's not what a guy from New Jersey was used to. But uh, for the last 19 years, I have had the incredible privilege of coaching people like Teresa McCurry, uh, who have a dream inside of them, a vision, and they have gifts and abilities that are just ready to go. And I feel like my job is to come alongside of people like Teresa and, and others that I get to coach and just be their encourager uh, and help draw them out. And so I am a coach. Uh, didn't know I'd ever be a coach. I was a pastor to begin with and uh, spent 10 years leading a church, pastoring a church in Boston. And now for the past 19 years have been coaching. Wow, that is really cool. So you, how did it come about? How did you like, okay, I think it's something here. You know, you're, you just automatically coach people, right? It's just like second nature for you. And then when did you say, you know what? It's something to this coaching thing. Yeah, well, I mean, back when I started coaching, which was about 1999, but, and then I, I went full-time in 2001, people would say to me, uh, Pastor T, what, what's, what sport do you coach? And I think they'd look <laughs> at me and they figure I, I certainly wasn't a gymnast. Uh, you know, I, was, I, prob I probably wasn't a good baseball player. They usually say football, which was at least close to things I played. <laughs> but but coaching coaching came for me as I realized that I really have a desire to develop the potential inside of people that often goes undeveloped and I'd even seen undeveloped in my own life. And so the whole concept of coaching was just really starting to emerge in the 1990s. In fact, Teresa, do you know where, where the word the derivation of the word coach comes from? Because I, I didn't. I have no idea yeah, where the yeah. word coach comes from. All right. So, I mean, most of us don't, right? We just assume, well, that's, you know, some sports coach, but a coach, like, I mean, I just learned this a few years ago. It actually comes from like coach Germany where they, where they made coaches, they made stage coaches, they made coaches and buggies. So what a coach is, okay, is someone who comes alongside of someone else and helps them get to where they need to go, okay? Well, I mean, we've experienced that with, with coaches um, in, our, in our sports, and most of us, especially guys, and now a lot of most women too, if you've had a coach, you have a deep respect for them because often they see something inside of you, but they help you get to where you need to go. So, I mean, I, I never, I mean, that didn't exist uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but it's actually the second fastest growing profession, according to some studies on the planet, mm -hmm. that coaching is growing. And I mean, I was a pastor who really desired to develop people. 
I right. just hadn't had a lot of those tools and I didn't okay. know that that was a possibility. Yeah, because I mean, as a pastor, then looking at your background, you went to the, the, the seminary school. Yeah, you go, there you go. And you also went to college. So what did you go to college for? To play football and be in a fraternity. And, <laughs> you know, you'd think I would have gone for the education, but uh, I didn't know better. Uh, but I, I ended up getting a government major. Okay. Um, and uh, studied so studied political science. Okay. And, and that and that was where when I was there, really, I mean, I found Christ. I found I found Christ in a real way. And I'd love to say it was in church. It was actually out after a uh, grain alcohol fraternity party. Okay. Where I I looked at my life and I said, all right, I need I need purpose more than just feeding my body. Uh, I I need to find what am I on this planet to do and open the bible in fact i literally have the same bible here that i opened, oh, yeah, really? opened then i mean it's it's beat up but i opened a bible that my grandmother had given me and uh and found that there was life and peace there that i didn't have anywhere else in my life wow so you found christ in college yeah, I mean, I, I had some, some, you know, some grandmothers who prayed for me. Of course. I had, I had some examples. I'd been to a couple of retreats, but it really wasn't, you know, often, like, you know, Pastor T, until you hit bottom in some way, you don't go, is there more? Is, is there God? And so for me, it was after, after kind of trashing my life that I, I reached out and, and, and found Jesus. Amen. That's that's a blessing. So did you do anything with your political science degree? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, avoid it in some ways. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think it, it set me up. It set me up to be asking questions. You know, I mean, I think I think a question that I, I've been asking for all this time, uh, Teresa, is how do how do people change? And I think I became, a, I went into government because I thought, well, maybe it's, you know, that's how people change and nothing wrong with government or people who, who work with it. But I found that I, that most people don't change because of the government. They change because of a person who loves them. They, they change because of someone who comes into their life, who sees something in them, who, who loves them and believes in them. And, and I realized that government and, and heading that direction wasn't where I found that that was going to bring about that kind of transformation. Okay, awesome. So what about when you started pastoring the church? Did you see the change that you were looking for in the people? Um, to an extent, yes. I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, I mean, I totally, I believe in the church. I believe in pastors. Uh, what I realized is it just as the more the church grew, uh, the more I felt like I was being removed from the one-on-one -on -one or the one-on-small -on -small group that I, I really came alive with. Right. And, and I think there's some people who go to seminary looking for that because they want to bring that kind of change. And, and coaching didn't exist at the time, so there was no way to do that as a profession. Um, but what I've, what I've seen is that there's a difference between education and extraction. Okay, and education is bringing knowledge, information, wisdom to people. Extraction is where you draw out from them what, what God is doing in your life. Um, one of the things I've, I've come to believe, even my kids have helped me believe this, is that God is inside of us. He's closer than we ever imagined. A lot of us tend to believe, you know, God is way up there. He's out there somewhere. And, and yet, you know, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. Thank you. And so what would it look like to have people who come alongside and draw out what God is in your life? So extraction, okay, means that you're, you're going and you're finding the gold. You're, you're seeking what God has put in somebody. And again, that didn't exist, you know, that I knew of 20 years ago. And so that's where coaching I, I tell, I, I say this to, to coaches and I'll say it here. You know, I believe coaches are today's new spiritual leaders. Okay. Not because there's not other spiritual leaders, right? but coaches are able to come alongside of business leaders, political leaders, uh, people in transition, youth, and they can draw out what God is doing in them and help them see it. 
And I just find that I love that. And I love helping other coaches see the difference they can make. Amen. So when you talk about the education and the extraction, so uh, I'm processing like the education is me just teaching you about the word of God, but the extraction is actually um, helping come alive on the inside of you, whatever that God given purpose is that he he's placing you. Is that right? Or correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, you are so right. You're right. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, like one of the, one of the main tools that a, that a, a teacher has is proposition, right? They, they teach. Uh, what, a, what a coach has is usually questions and listening. Okay. Okay. And so one of the most important thing that we can do as we're growing somebody is ask them an amazing question. Uh, there was an actress a number of years ago, uh, Vanessa Redgrave, that's, that's who it was. She said um, that, that questions that what, what most people, and actually, let me give you a different quote because I'm blanking on hers. Okay. Um, Jonas Salk who invented the polio vaccine. Okay. He said, what most people believe as the moment of discovery is really the discovery of the question. Okay. So what, what a coach does is they, they bring a question to you that, that draws you. Actually, what Vanessa Redgrave said is ask the right questions and you'll get the right answers. Okay. So, so you know, again, there's nothing wrong with propositional truth. But my wife, Mindy, was speaking at a, at a conference a couple of years ago, Teresa. She, she leads a ministry called Soul Care, okay. soulcare.com. And uh, it's amazing to have a wife who, I mean, I'm sitting here listening. She was over there speaking on an interview today, and I was taking notes thinking, oh, I, I should listen to that. <laughs> uh, but but she, she was talking at the Q conference a few years ago, and she said, there's a difference between the transfer of information and transformation. And I listened to that. I'm like, what did you just say? There's That's a good. difference between That's the transfer good. of information and transformation. What, what do you think that means? Like, as you hear that, what, what is what, what sticks I mean, out to when you? I think about it, you said the transfer, is inf- transfer of information. I'm just telling you something, you're receiving it. But a transformation is like that. I'm going to take that information in and it's going to change my life. You know, so even when you were talking about the education and the extraction, was that the word you used? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I remember it made me think about when you were coaching me. So when you were coaching me, I mean, you really helped inspire me come to life. Right. Because that wasn't hard. That wasn't hard. Well, that's good. So you really helped inspire me come to life. And you was just like making it just so simple. So common denominator is so clear. Okay. Well, what's the difference in motivation and inspiration? Why aren't you an inspirational speaker? What makes you a motivational speaker? So that goes back to what you said. It's not just, it's transformation. So you transform the way that I think and you didn't just give me information. It was information that opened up something that was already inside of me. Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, that's not hard, especially because you had inside you the you were born to inspire Amen. Like that. That was that was what that is who you are. That is how God created you. Amen. You're born to inspire and ignite fires in other people that they that they they didn't even know that fire could be built into a flame. And you're and you're an amazing example of it. So as a coach. My job isn't to give you something that you don't have. My job is to is to extract it and help you see it. Yeah. You know, and, and so that's why I believe that coaches are today's new spiritual leaders because they can extract what God has put inside of somebody. And it, you know, God's put it inside. It doesn't, they have it already. But so many of us have been beat down. You know, we've been beat down because we heard, we heard people tell us, well, you can't do that. Right. You're not that smart. You can't build a business. You, you can't speak publicly. And, and it was probably because of something in them, right? I mean, you've probably had people tell you things like that too, Teresa, right? Yeah, I mean, to some, I didn't listen to it, but yeah. <laughs> you didn't listen. But how come you didn't listen? How come? Like you said, it, it was just something inside of me that just knew that, you know, it doesn't matter what you say. And it's ironic, you will see, I remember uh, somebody telling me at this time, um, I think it was a social worker that I should not pursue 
the beauty industry. She told me that I shouldn't pursue the beauty industry because it was so volatile and you might have customers today. You might not have customers tomorrow. And when I opened up my salon and spa, I wish I knew her name. I wish I would have, I would have invited her to come and get a service to see what she was telling me yes. that I couldn't do. So yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and every every entrepreneur who goes any in, in into anything will have the naysayers, and you'll have people who will say, "No, I don't want to come to your salon. I don't want to use your business. I don't want to hire you as a coach." And so, I mean, one of the reasons we need the inspirers and the coaches in our lives is because they need to counteract and they need to pull out what we really do have to offer. Because there's so many voices that are going to tell you you can't and you know we can listen i mean you know what would you be doing if you'd listened to those voices you wouldn't be doing a lot of what you're doing now i mean you you know you're you're a woman you can't do those things you're you're too young you're too old you're not educated enough and you know those things crush a lot of what god has put inside of people so yeah, so when it comes to the transformational coaching, so the transformational coaching, when you say that, that that's like, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but what makes a, a coach a coach and a transformational coach a transformational coach? Great question, great question. So, um, so coaching is helping someone move from where they are to where they need to go. It's, it's the, the, the transportation term, okay? So, Number one, a lot of people don't know the transformational person they really are. You know, C.S. Lewis uh, talked about that, you know, a lot of us just don't know that, that we, we live in a mud puddle when God has called us to swim in an ocean, okay? So part of it is that a transformational coach can see the transformed you. There's an element of faith that I, I mean, I, I think of Martin Luther King saying, I may not be the man I could be. I may not be the man I would be. I may not be the man I should be, but thank God I'm not the man I once was. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and so like the transformational coach sees that in you and, and that is a big jump. Okay. It's not a little tweak for most of us to be who God really created us to be is to live into to an us that we may not recognize. I mean, my, even just seeing and knowing what you're doing now, Teresa, I mean, even in three or four years, you have stepped into things. You've come and, and accepted your calling. And so a transformation is going to the caterpillar. You're gonna be a butterfly someday. And the, butter, and the caterpillar is gonna go, what are you talking about? <laughs> I see it. You may not see it, but I see it. And so there's an element of the transformational coach has faith not to have someone become who they're not, but to become the butterfly that they really are. And, you know I mean? and yet, you know, I mean, we know there were people who came into our lives, whether they were teachers or parents or coaches who saw something. In fact, I was just telling somebody, I, I played a year of college football. Okay. Um, and it, but it helped me get into the college that I went to. And so a person asked me, you know, what, what made you be willing to apply to play football in college? And I said, I, what, I, I saw my football coach one day after a gym class. And I said to him, do you think I could play college football? And without skipping a beat, he said, a college would be lucky to have a guy like you. I mean, in, in that one second, he could have he could have built my dream or crushed my dream. Right. Right. That's good. So when you said, you know, the transformational coach is looking at you through the lens of faith. You know, the transformational coach is looking at not where you are right now, but what you could be, you know, with the right nurturing, the right um, coaching, the right inspiration or what have you. And it's ironic when you say that, because I always going to come back to me in our coaching sessions. And I remember going back to the motivation and the inspiration. So the motivation, I'm going to motivate you to do something that I want you to do, right? If I inspire you, I'm inspiring you to do something that's already on the inside of you. And then it's just bringing that thing to fruition, right? So when you talk about spiritual leaders, so you're saying transformational coaches are today's spiritual leaders. Expound on that. Yeah. 
So, so what, what you were saying, I mean, often there's very few people in our lives who are building into us who don't have some kind of responsibility or agenda, okay? Um, I, now, I, I believe that more coaches and pastors and leaders need to learn from coaching. But what a coach does is they have no other agenda except for you to become who you are supposed to be. Okay. And like they, their job is to free you is to, to empower you, not, not because they're getting, you know, if you win, you know, I mean, like, so when, when I, when I come and see people like you, who I've been able to, by the grace of God, coach doing great things, I am inspired. I am encouraged. Okay. But I don't get another check on my, you know, it's not like, it's not building anything for, for me. So I think, I think there's few people in life who have no other agenda, but to build into us. And, and I don't need, I don't believe every coach needs to be a paid professional. I mean, I think there's people who can retire and coach and, and, and mentor young, young women, young men, um, people who are in life transition. And, uh, and so I, I don't believe every coach needs to be paid, but I do believe there's been a need for a profession that is about helping someone get to where they need to go. Um, and, and have someone who will walk with them. So like, I get this question a bunch, Teresa, what's the difference between a counselor and a coach? You, you ever get that question? I have, I have. Well, for me, it wasn't a counselor. It was, um, what's the difference in doing um, a, con a con consulting? You know, consulting. So, All right. right. Yeah. So I would get it like consultants because you know, with your help, I became a beauty entrepreneur coach. Not doing that anymore, but we'll talk about that later. But with your help, and it's like so it, you just made me niche it, look, be specific. Who can I help? How can I help? And so it's like, okay, no, I'm not a beauty consultant. I'm a beauty entrepreneur coach. So it was different because, like you said, the coach. I think a consultant kind of like almost helps you do the work, right? I'm just telling you what to do and giving you examples. And, and and it's up you up to you to do the work yes yeah so i mean in a sense the 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 coach like i i, I tell people like if you're going to climb a mountain um you know the the mentor okay the mentor might say hey i've climbed this mountain before let me tell you how to you know where to go what paths to go the consultant might say hey let me give you the strategy and the maps for the mountain the coach is going to say, hey, let's make sure that's the right mountain, okay? Is that the, really the mountain you're supposed to climb? And then let's, let's, let's create a plan, think through what is the best way for you to climb a mountain? You know, when you've climbed a mountain in the past, what works for you? Mm -hmm. All right, and then I'm going to go with you um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on the journey and, and check in like where you, where you are in the different places in the mountain. Uh, a counselor is gonna get heal, help you be healed from the past mountains and molehills mole hill, mole you've climbed, right? <laughs> they know that you've been wiped out on some of your mountains. They know that some of some people who climb mountains with you kicked you and beat you and you've got wounds because of mountains, all right? Right. Thank God for counselors, all right? We need our counselors. And, and as a coach, I know, and I need to know when to go, hey, you need to go work with a counselor. Right. But the coach, the coaches is, is, is going to deal with your mindset. They're going to deal with issues, but they're going to be walking with you towards the conclusion of, of getting to the top of the mountain and getting safely home. Awesome. That's a good example to, to point out those three and what the expectation would be if you were working with, if I was working with a mentor, if I was working with a counselor, or if I'm working with a coach, this is right. what I can expect to get. But I'm still loving the whole spiritual leader, you know, mm, that, that, that the Thanks whole coaching that. thing is about spiritual leadership yep. in today's society. We haven't even talked about COVID, but mm -hmm. I mean, wh 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 where are you going with the whole, we are the new spiritual leaders as coaches? Right. Right. Well, so, you know, one of the one of the things that I've become super passionate about is is the inner game of, of somebody's life. Um, there was a book that was on my nightstand when I was growing up. I was all into sports and it was called the inner game of tennis. OK, well, in, in the spiritual life, we get to be connected to the ultimate inner game. Okay, and the, the Bible in, in Romans 12, too, it talks about that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Yeah. Okay, and that is a spiritual transformation that is changing the way we think. 
right? And, and science is even now saying, you know, the brain changes. It used to be um, that people looked at the brain and said, hey, if that's the way you are, you're stuck with that brain. Um, there's a concept that's called neuroplasticity, okay? Like neuroscience. Neuroplasticity means that the brain can actually change itself. Okay, our thoughts literally change the, the, the cells and the neurons inside of our brains. Okay, is that spiritual? Well, I believe so because I believe that we are not just brains, we are not just bodies, we are, we've been given the breath of God, we've been given souls. And, you know, I, I went to seminary and I, I didn't know, like, what is the soul? I mean, you get soul food and soul music and, you know, <laughs> right? But what is the soul? Or, or you get the salvation of the soul, right? Yeah. But, but like God breathed into us in Genesis chapter one, we became a living soul, right? Like we became, and, and the concept of, all right, you know, most of us know we're supposed to take care of our bodies. Right. Like, you know, in fact, I, I, I laugh. Like when I was, when, you know, back, I know I'm a little older than you, Teresa, but I mean, it used to be that I, I thought like, you know, bananas were good for you. You know, mm -hmm. I thought fruit was good for you. I used to eat like oats and be, and be thinking that that was the best energy. Um, or, you know, eggs, like, you know, what, what's good for you, right? Yeah. And now like, there's all these questions of what, and yet we know that we've got to take care of our bodies. Mm -hmm. you know, we've got to go to work out. We've got to eat right. We, if we don't, and yet what about the soul? You know, if God has given us this, this breath of life, God breathed into us and we became living beings. Years ago, my wife and I just said, how do we care for the soul? You know, like what, what does it mean to be intentional about doing that? And it, I mean, I think there was a very simple look at the spiritual life and there's been leaders like Dallas Willard and others who have started to wake us up to there really are practices that help us grow spiritually. But how do, who comes into our lives who can help us understand how do we um, become the spiritually alive people that we're supposed to be? I think that's an amazing point. And then the point about our mindset and then how our brain cells change, you know, you can almost see it, you know, it's like when you think about it, you say mind, body, and no, you say spirit, soul, and body. So when we talk about our soul, most of the time we're talking about our mind, our will, our emotions, and our intellect. So right. knowing that now scientifically they're saying that when your when your mind changes, your cells and all of that stuff changes, that's so God, right? It's, it's like the it's renewing incredible. of your mind, the transformation of your mind. And then we as Christians, we understand that the battlefield takes place in our mind. And then we understand that if we're bitter and we're resentful and we have fear and we have doubt, it can physically make us sick. Yeah. Well, and, and Teresa, you know, I think, I think all of us have looked at our lives at one point or another, and, and we've said, why am I not more mature? <laughs> why am I not more loving? Why am I not more peaceful? Why do I not have more peace? And so, you know, years ago, I remember, I, I literally, I was a pastor of, of our church, and uh, I'm not proud of this, but somebody left our church, and they told me they were leaving. I get off the phone with them, and back, back in those days, we used to have this thing called a concordance, right? That was a huge blue book. Yeah. Uh, did you ever see one of those? I got one. You got one. All right. All right. I don't have mine anymore because of this. I picked up a concordance. I threw it across the room. It broke all into pieces. Okay. And my wife walked in the door and she said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm terrible. And I think there, there's times that we hit, hit, you know, pockets in our lives where we are not doing well. And at that time, what, what do we need? What, what, what is going on in our soul? And what I realized is I, I believed I could be more mature. I believed I could have more joy and be, be you know, like the Bible says one of the fruits of the spirit is joy. And yet most of my time in my life was not joyful. 
And, and so that's a spiritual question. You know, why am I not experiencing more joy? Why am I not experiencing more life in my soul? Why am I throwing concordances across the room? All right. So when you, when you have those things happen, you go, what's, what's not working in my spiritual life? You know, and, and that's, that's where I feel like part of my journey over the last 20, 25 years is to go, number one, how do I change and keep changing? And number two, how do I help others who want to change become who God wants them to be? And that is a spiritual journey and a spiritual question. And that is so true. And it's like, to me, I think sometimes people look at us as spiritual leaders, pastors or whatever. Like we don't have those issues. Why don't you do a concordance job? Shame on you. You know what I'm saying? But thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Give me more. Beat, beat me up. Beat me up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you know when you talk about the fruit of the spirit it's like I was edgy I was short I was snappy I, I, I was not showing love because yeah. people were getting on my last nerve right and then I said okay Lord what do I need to do and he took me to the fruit of the spirit and I started reading the spirit love joy peace gentleness long suffering self-control and was just really going over that and started meditating on that and started eating that word every day and I seen myself change my husband seen me change he even recognized oh my god you're changing and then when i would revert back to those words he would say i think you need to where'd start you reading. go where'd you go that's right well, so, <laughs> need to start reading the fruit of the spirit again <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and so there is the sense that you know we need to be connected to the vine and and that when we're connected to the vine it affects us physically spiritually emotionally and and so when we're when we're disconnected when we're not loving all those things, it's a spiritual issue. So the reason I brought the Bible, um, the one that, you know, that I've had for a long, long time, is there's a verse in 3 John that most of us, you know, would read right past that, that I feel like is, applies to this, Teresa. Okay. okay? Like, I mean, most, most of us would go, I didn't even know there was a third John. I mean, I knew there was a John. He wrote three more books. And I'm thinking that you're going to say something about prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. Is that it? <laughs> That's it. You nailed it. You nailed it. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well, or even as your soul is oh, prospering. Prosper. So how come you knew that scripture, Teresa, besides because I know you're a Bible knowledge junkie? My mm -hmm. husband and I, we say that almost every day when we pray. You know, we say, wow. because it's like, we want to prosper and be in health and not just physical health. We want our soul to prosper as well, yes. because especially now with you arming me with that information, as our soul prosper, our mind changes, understanding that the battlefield takes place in the mind so yes. if your mind is changing your mind is getting stronger and gearing towards your spirituality and that's just going to help you be even more prosperous yes i mean so jesus jesus said something you know that we probably have heard um, he said you know what does it prosper a man or woman if you gain the whole world and yet you forfeit your soul okay yeah. You lose your soul. And we, we tend to think of that often as well. You don't want to go to hell. You know, you know, you don't want to not. But but Jesus cared a lot about the way we lived our everyday life. OK, so that means we have to prioritize our souls and the prosperity of our souls. And so part of the question of how do people change is how do we how do we intentionally prioritize our souls every day? so that it brings that into our marriage, it brings it into our parenting, it brings it into our business, it brings it into our creativity, it brings it into our finances. Every aspect of those things is not just about getting more knowledge, it's about having a prosperous soul. And as our soul prospers, our health prospers. As our soul prospers, I mean, and, and of course, you're going to, there's disease, there's challenges, there's other people, okay? But Jesus seemed to, knew, to know that life's not all about gaining the world, even growing great businesses, which I am all about, which I know you are, yeah. but it's not going to matter until you prioritize your soul. And when you prioritize your soul, you're going to bring the better you to those things.
That that is so true. And that brings me to right now you have the soul challenge going on. Mm-hmm. Tell the viewing audience um what does that look like? What does that mean? The soul yeah. challenge. Yeah. So most people don't put coaching soul and challenge together, right? I mean, they, <laughs> th- those are like you know, they're kind of like, uh, there was a, a, commercial, a, a, number, a, a commercial a number of years ago that was about uh, um, ski jumping and recliners. Like, let's bring those things together, you know. Uh, but so kind of like soul and coaching and, uh, and, and challenge. So, so I've been coaching now for 19 years, okay. And what, like, like I've been saying, I've come to believe is that the real change happens when we get to the level of the soul when we draw out what God is really doing at a deep level, when we help other people see what God has created them in their soul. And uh, the guy's last name is Thurman. And you may know this quote because I know it would be, uh, it would be that what, what is it? Um, Golly, I should have written that quote down, but, but St. Irenaeus said, you know, that the glory of God is a man fully alive. Yeah. Okay? yeah. So, so that is, that life comes from the life of the soul. So, so coaching that is just about information or even about goals, okay, is good. But what I believe is great is when we, we are able to equip coaches who know how to draw out the life of the soul, yeah. you know how to draw out your real passion. So like in coaching people, I'll, I'll be coaching somebody and, and I, whether I can see them or I'm just on the phone, they'll have tears in their eyes and they go, I don't even know why I'm crying. And what I've come to see is like the soul is revealing itself. Like somebody's saying, I just care about, you know, people who are discouraged and depressed. I care about inspiring people. Um, and, and, and something inside of them is almost like their soul is showing up. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's, and, and that's a holy moment. It really is. It really is. Cause it's like one day your soul just opens up and, and it's like somebody is speaking directly to your soul. Right. right, right. Yeah. That, that matters. So why do you think coaching the soul matters for such a time as this? Well, I mean, that's, that's not a, a, I mean, you've seen, we are in a, in a time of great anxiety and stress. We're more divided, right? I mean, there's divisions, there's, there's fractured relationships. I mean, I, 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 some statistics to me are mind boggling, such as, do you know that 20 to 22 service, service people or veterans kill themselves each day? Okay. I mean, like crazy. I mean, and, and I've got people connected to me um, family, you know, distant family, you know, who've, who've committed suicide. I know, I mean, just so, today, somebody else told me about the son of a friend who, who overdosed. And, and, and so we've got soul issues going on. Okay. And, and, and that's where I believe that there's just loneliness. Okay. Um, I'll tell it, I'll tell the story, Teresa, there was years ago, I was, I was still pastoring and there was a, a gathering with a, a Fortune 100 business leader who had just retired. This was in Boston. And there, it was a gathering of business leaders and pastors. I think there were 50 business leaders, 50 pastors meeting with this former CEO. And he talked about his experience in leadership. And I got to ask him a question. They had a question and answer time. And I, I, I said, said to him, you know, what would you say you would do differently if you were to, you know, lead your company again. And he said, he, he looked down and, and just almost seemed like a long time. And then he looked up with tears that just like started like a waterwork streaming down his face. He said, I was so lonely. He said, I wished I had people in my life who I could tell what was really going on. Wow. I didn't have, I didn't have safe places. And as I, as I heard that, tears started to stream down my face too. And I was like, what's going on with me? But I think it's, it's that sense that we're lonely. You know, I mean, COVID has created loneliness. We're isolated. And, and so one of the things in, in the garden, the Garden of Eden, you know, God says it's not good for man to be alone. And so we need the people in our lives who, who create the space for community. 
And so, you know, in, in a time where so many people are more isolated than ever, I feel like coaches and people equipped to coach can bring that kind of community to leaders and to people who are in any phase of their life. Yeah. I mean, we know that 20 somethings, they, they, you know, uh, social media isn't working. Okay. It, it's not creating the kind of community that we need. Yeah. So, so I would say, you know, what would happen in our world if we, we learn how to better create that safety and community? Yeah, that, that's good because I think no matter what level you, you're on, you need community. You need a safe place that you can lay your head. You need somebody mm -hmm. that you can be transparent with. You know, you don't always have to show up as the leader or show up as whatever, as the owner, you know, you need a, a group of people that you can have community with. So talking about that, what does a healthy soul look like? Yeah. So, um, so going back, you know, like, again, like when we ask, what does a healthy person physically look like? Right. You know, like we, we, we have these pictures of what they're supposed to look like. Usually it just, you know, gives a body. Um, but even, even in physical health, we've had a hard time defining what does it look like, you know, to have health. But we have the Bible where you can go back to the Bible and, and see what is the, what did God intend us to look like if we really had healthy souls? Okay. Okay. So, so you go, so, I mean, I want to encourage all our listeners or watchers, I guess, to, to oh, go to oh. <laughs> uh, both, go to Genesis chapter two and ask what, what does a healthy soul look like according to Genesis chapter two. And I want to bring out four things that are in Genesis chapter two that are almost like, you know, magnetic north for what it looks like to have a healthy soul. Okay. okay. So, so number one, um, it talks about something again, that most of us probably you don't because you're, you see these things, uh, <laughs> but most of us would skip right by. It says that God created trees that were beautiful to look at and good for eating. Mm -hmm. Why does the Bible describe that they were beautiful to look at and good for eating? Okay. And, and again, it's like, this is before the fall. This is before we get to sin. We have beautiful trees and good to eat trees. And what I've come to believe is that the first thing that we look for when we're helping coach and create a healthy soul is you relish beauty you relish the things that you have. You're grateful. Okay. Like, man, that tree is beautiful. I mean, the fall right now, right? Wow. That tree is beautiful. Um, out, out of here in Colorado, we've, we've got uh, the, what are the name of those trees? Not, not pine. They're, they're beech or I can't even remember the name of, but they have big, beautiful yellow leaves. All right. So the whole concept of number one is, is we're, we're spending time each day appreciating. Okay, we appreciate beauty. We, we, we treasure our food. We're not just chewing right through it. We, ten, we, ten, we take the time to do that. The second thing it talks about, although it talks about more than just a few, but number two, it, it talks about responsibility. Okay, God gives meaningful responsibility to Adam to care for the garden. And what I've come to believe is we all need our meaningful responsibility. We need to know what is God made for me to do. It's like, have you ever been a part of a gathering, Teresa, and you've got no role and you're just standing there? You know me, Jeff, I'm going to do something. <laughs> you're going to do something. You're going to find it. But when you don't have a role, how do you yeah. feel? How you do you feel, feel like like a third wheel, like you just, why am I here? You know, you just yes. sitting there. It's hard to just be the guest, right? You yes. feel like you need to be doing something. And I love this whole responsibility piece. We can stay here all day. Cause I think that's something that's missing in a lot of people right now. It's like being responsible for whatever and for you. Yeah, yeah. well, it starts with us, right? Yeah. But, but the, the whole idea that God made us to bring our participation into the world. And so when we don't know what God's called us to do, what's the kingdom calling? What is the vision that God has for me? We're not fully alive. So part of what I believe that coaches can bring to our generation is the ability to draw that out and go, this is your, your, your kingdom responsibility. Okay. Wow. So that's part of soul health. Number three, is um, God then tells Adam 
you can eat from this tree, but you can't eat from that tree, okay? Why does he do that? Because a healthy soul is able to have restraint, okay? Mm -hmm. We don't always like that, but if we just, I mean, if you ever, you, you, you know, with kids, right? You can't just let them do anything. When a kid feels healthy restraint, they feel loved. Part of my job is to bring healthy restraint in my life, is to say, you know what? Jeff loves cookies. Jeff should not eat cookies all the time. <laughs> Jeff loves wine and beer. He can't drink that all the time. Like, so, so having that, the ability to say no and be okay with that is part of soul health. Okay, oh, that, that God has designed us to, to be able to say no. So addiction is when we can't say no. Mm -hmm. So part of our healing is being able to regain our own ability to say no. Okay. And that, that's good, that whole restraint, because yeah, I mean, I like wine and I can't drink wine all day, every day. How would I go to work? How would I do? Well, exactly. that works well, just knowing that I call it my communion. So when I have my communion, it's limited. Yes. Yes. So, so, I mean, we feel good when we're able to say a healthy no. I mean, there's been all this talk about boundaries lately, mm -hmm. you know, when somebody else can't violate, we need to be able to say to other people, no. And so, so again, like the health of the soul is, is part of our ability to say, Hey, I would love wine, but I'm going to say no. Okay. So our, our being able to grow that is part of, of what even coaching can help. So like what I, what I find when I'm coaching someone is I'm not just helping them say yes, I'm helping them say a good no. Okay? That's good. That's so good. that's number three. Yeah. Number four is uh, relationships that, that take away loneliness. Okay. It's not good for man to be alone. God creates this other person and we just need soul friends in our lives. We need the people in our lives who we can have a depth of conversation with, who we can be our real self with, who we're not hidden with. And so God, God creates them so they're naked and unashamed with each other. Yeah. I think most, most people, most guys, especially I'll speak for guys, we, we have few or no soul friends. Hmm. Okay. And, and so the relationships that we need in our lives are the people who we can share the real us with, not dump on them. Right. Okay but we can share the real us with. And again, you know, that, that can start in a counseling relationship. It can start in a, in a coaching relationship, but we need those who, who, where we can really be ourselves. And even if we have just a few of those, it frees our soul. Yeah. And I think that with that, that's all you need is a few. You don't have to be this whole, I tell people it's one thing to be transparent. It's another thing to be an open book. And then with us having discernment from the Holy Spirit, we should know who to be transparent with and who to be an open book with because you sharing some of your hangups with somebody is probably going to help set them free, you know? So I, I love that. I, I think that that's really good. So the first one is appreciating beauty, mm -hmm. appreciating, appreciating the beauty that God has around us. And if you're intentional about that, you can find that in anything, correct? absolutely you find it and find it in that light bulb <laughs> you know? yeah i mean it's it's best when you can find it in a beautiful tree that's turning color right but what? you know but we can find beauty if we say god what what's what do i appreciate today mm -hmm. i mean my dog is sitting right there barney i you know i'll often start my day in fact every day i start my day with taking out my cell phone and i use evernote and i write what do i appreciate that's and, you know, I mean, I'll appreciate my wife. I'll appreciate my sons, my daughter-in-laws. Sometimes I look down and I go, man, I appreciate Barney. You know? <laughs> and that's good. Cause I like yesterday when I got off work, I had looked up and the clouds was like each way that you looked in the sky, the clouds were different. And I actually took out my cell phone and took pictures. And then I seen, it was like a little rainbow in the corner. And I just appreciated the North, the South, the East and the West and took this. And it just appreciated that. So it's just those little things yes. for appreciation, the responsibility that that's number two responsibility. Responsibility. Yeah. I mean, and resp it's responsibility for something that matters. Okay. Okay. And, and how it matters is we need to understand that, you know, taking care of the garden, was, was caring for the creation. So caring for our environment, making our bed, you know, like what doing the things that we're, we're, we're taking responsibility 
and, and creating environment or we're, we're bringing life to other people through our work, um, that brings life to our souls. We're meant for, and, and what I, uh, I used to work in the financial industry and I used to help people retire. And what I found is it was really important not to have someone just leave their job it was to say, if I'm leaving, what am I going to that matters? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with this phase of my life that really is important? And so, so that even if you're retiring, you need to go, what is the work God's called me to now? Yeah. And, and there's all these studies that show if you don't have that, you'll lack health, you'll lack vitality, you won't want to get out of bed in the morning. So at every stage of our life, you know, what does it look like to have that responsibility? That responsibility and the restraint. I love the restraint, right? So I love the example of no matter how much I love to eat cake and cookies, I can't eat cake and cookies all day. The right. What would it do to your soul if you did, right? You, uh -huh. you know, you need a it, nap. It <laughs> I need more than a nap but in that restraint just even knowing how to say no because i think sometimes when you're a spiritual leader people are under the misconception that you're going to say yes about everything all the time and that's not true yeah and that's really important i mean if, if there's anybody listening you know that that is a pastor i mean I, i've been a pastor i know you are a pastor um it, it, it is really important to know that you've been called to some things you're not called to everything. everything. You don't have every gift. You don't have every ability. And, and you fully alive is the best gift that you're bringing to those that you're leading. And so if that means you need to go and say, hey, I'm, I'm taking three days off or I'm taking a month off or I'm, I'm going to go, you know, fishing. I'm, I'm going to go, you know, go and spend time at the beautician. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. I mean, that, that is caring for you. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. And some so much of us in leadership, we have a hard time saying yes to love ourselves. Yeah. And uh, and that that's a critical function. Yeah, that healthy restraint is good. And then the last one, the relationship, soul friends, having those relationships is crucial, critical and key to me, especially during this time of COVID. I mean, my husband and I, we always say at least we have each other. And then our heart goes out to our single friends who live alone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, like choosing, when I went through depression. I mean, I, I now look back and I know, and eventually I went on antidepressants, but w when I was in depression, I would isolate from people, okay? And that, that's one of the, you know, signs almost of depression is if mm -hmm. we continually isolate. So the opposite of that is when you, you, you spend time in healthy community. You're, you're not always in healthy community because right. there's something about the need for protection and solitude. But who, who is your healthy community that you need the life to be around, introvert or extrovert? Right. Well, this has been good. We've just been talking, talking, talking. I never even paused and gave you a chance to do a commercial and give out your information or anything. And we got like six more minutes to go. So at this time, <laughs> would you give out your contact information and tell us about um, your Coaching Transformation Academy? Yeah, yeah. So so like, like you've heard me say, I believe that coaches are today's new spiritual leaders, not the only spiritual leaders, but but there are people who, who are going, you know what, I think this coaching thing might be me. And some of the signs of that are people confide in you. You're curious about people. You want to draw out the potential in people. And one of the things I'm, I know you've heard people say this to you, uh, Teresa, is I've never told anybody this before, but okay, I can't tell anybody else this. And so coaches are often the confidants to people confidants to people in leadership, confidants to people in life transition. And so there's a, there's a test. If you go to coachingtransformationacademy.com, big, big long URL, coachingtransformationacademy.com. All right. I even spell it wrong sometimes. Okay. So you may want to put a link, but if you go there, there's a thing that says, you know, is coaching for me. And it's just an assessment to go, are you already a coach and you just need equipping? And one of the best ways to learn coaching is to be coached, okay? That coaches need coaches and coaching is learned through. So the way we've designed CTA is what we call it for short, is that everybody has a coach, 
everybody gets coached because you experience it. You see the transformation it brings. So if you're listening and you're going, wow, I want to learn coaching and bring it to my team, or I want to potentially become a professional coach now, part-time, full-time, we've created a process and a community that is about that. And then I've written three books that I actually don't sell on Amazon or any place else that are just, I've got some of them here. Um, let's see, here's two of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. One is called The Eight Coaching Habits. The other one's called The Thriving Coach. And then there's this one. Nope, that one's called The Thriving Coach too. Um, I don't know where the other one, other one is, but it's, it's transformational coaching. But it's, it's just equipping coaches who want to bring this coaching way of life to their leadership or become full-time coaches. Yeah. Yeah. So is that the only way you want them to contact you through your website? Yeah. I mean, jeffcaliguire.com is where I blog and write, you know, all kinds of thoughts on these things. So you can go there as well and follow me, follow me there and, you know, sign up to receive uh, things. Um, so, you know, there's, there's the coaching, it's be becoming a coach. And then the other thing is there's coaches now that I'm working with who coach people who are asking, what is my purpose? How do I how do I take this and, and focus what I'm doing in business? How do I grow my soul? And and I know you coach as well, uh, Teresa. And so like I would point people to you as well as an amazing coach, having worked with you and trained you and seen this inside of you. But um, there's other books. If you go on Amazon, look up Jeff Caliguire, you'll see that I I like to write and um, written a book called The Habits of Hope. I have that awesome. book. I was I was waiting for you to mention the one that I have. I'm like, I got one or two of his books. I have The Habits of Hope. I got yep. that. Have, have you read it? I have. You have. All right. That Good. was way back, what, in 2000? <laughs> About four years ago. Yeah, years in 2016. Yeah. I want to yeah. say I got that book for you and then The Habits of Hope. So yeah, it was a, a very good read. Very good read. Thank you. So I appreciate that. And um, any closing remarks before we, before we um, log out here in the next four minutes? Yeah, so, so, you know, I mean, again, coming back to the quote from uh, the ancient church father, Irenaeus, you know, that, that God, um, the, the glory of God is a man or woman fully alive. Fully alive. And, and that is so important. So like when you're, when you're experiencing any symptoms that are like, you know, there's something missing, there, there's an ache. It's almost like when you're, when you're feeling a little sick and you're starting to have something come in your throat, mm -hmm. you know, now everybody stays away from you. Right. But, but there's like, there's symptoms of soul neglect. Um, me, my wife and I have a process that we work with that help people know what is soul neglect versus soul health. Okay. If you're experiencing things that where you know that you're met for more, that there's something that's not fully alive, that you're feeling a discouragement, that's a time that you need to reach out. You need community. And it could be you need a coach. Mm -hmm. It could be, but, but don't settle. You know what I mean? I think one of the things a lot of us is we go, hey, I'm just going to do this until I retire. Or I, I guess I'll never love my life, love, love what I do. And, and that's where I go, you know what? That's, you don't have to settle. You're mm -hmm. meant for more. God made you unique. Your identity is one who is loved and favored, you're gifted. And, uh, and my, my desire, and I know yours too, is to free the potential uh, inside of God's people and, and change, change their lives and change other people's lives. Amen. That's so good. Jeff, thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest today. We really appreciate everything that you share and the whole thing about the soul. We, we really appreciate that. And as business leaders, as community leaders, as emerging entrepreneurs, I do know that your soul has to be together before you can help somebody in what they're doing. So thanks so much for your information. We appreciate you. You're so welcome. And I appreciate you, Teresa. And Super T is, is how I, I've known you for many years and you, you are super T and I'm, I love what you're doing. I love this, this thing. Uh, I would just say to your listeners, keep sharing it, you know, get yeah. the word out, you know, yeah. put, hit, 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 share. Share, and, uh, like, share have a watch party. Yes. Have a watch party for us. Yep. So 
Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm your host, Teresa McCurry, also known as Pastor T. And this is Christian Networking Entrepreneurs, where we interview emerging entrepreneurs, small business owners, and community leaders. And remember, if you don't network, you don't work. Have a great day. Bye-bye.